All right, we are now recording. Happy International Commedia dell'arte day! Yay! Yay, and Shrove Tuesday. And Shrove Tuesday, it's a good day. Uh, so, um, hello everybody, we are here celebrating International Commedia dell'arte day, February 25th, 2020. And uh, first of all, I also wanna thank all of the folks that joined in on our first session. This is the second session. And we have learned a great deal from the first webinar this afternoon. Uh, we had a whole bunch of great people joining us. This is a second session. And both sessions are gonna be posted and made available to the staff at uh, International Commedia dell'arte day uh, so that they can share it with the world. And we'll also be posting it on my troops webpage, uh, www.eforenzi.com. So it's all gonna be cool, sharing wide. And uh, today we have uh, five, uh, four plus me panelists that are going to share ideas and their wisdom about producing media, how to make more of it happen. Uh, because studying in books and putting on some plays actually does take more than just the intellectual resources we can muster. It actually takes a lot of logistics and strategy and thinking about what really gets an audience to sit down and watch. So uh, we've got two topics we're gonna explore. One is the logistics, which is um, things like uh, find rehearsal space and finding the stage that you're gonna uh, perform on and marketing and things that actually make the, um, make the play happen. Then there's also content. What makes content really engaging with Commedia? What can you do to actually take that meaty stuff and uh, make it exciting for the audience so that they are happy they sat and watched you and they might come back and do it again? So those are the two topics. And um, I'm going to briefly introduce each panelist so that um, we have an idea of where everybody's coming from. But then you guys are going to introduce yourselves, um, uh, introduce yourselves in a little more detail about where you're coming from. So we're going to go in order of uh, Rachel, Paula, Jay, and then Amanda. Uh, now, all of these folks are friends of mine. We all met in the Society for Creative Anachronism. And everybody also does have some experience in community theater. Uh, and uh, we've all had a touch of Shakespeare floating in there. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, um, everybody here has in common. And then everybody's had their own individual experiences to share from. So first we have Rachel Brune, and Rachel is a, uh, an accomplished author, accomplished and published author. And she also publishes uh, other people's works. And she's also um, very well versed in Shakespeare and able to hold her own in uh, great companies of Shakespeare experts. So um, she helped us, uh, E. Ferenzi, produce a fun uh, Commedia Shakespeare mashup production of Twelfth Night, a couple of years ago, and that was crazy fun. And, um, and the video is available on efrenzy.com. So, uh, Rachel, uh, you get to start us off. Tell us about your thoughts of uh, logistics, and we'll, t we'll deal with the content on the second round. Awesome. So, the, um, when we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, I mentioned I was kind of focusing on the logistics of communicating and drawing in the people that you want to be attending. Um, some, and, and the reason that I think I had that focus was being in the community theater, um, working with Sweetie Shakespeare in Fayetteville. Um, a lot of the challenges could be overcome, like the, a lot of the challenges on stage could be overcome with ingenuity, with actors' choices, with the, the things that, peop that creative people can come up with um, if they don't have, you know, throne rooms or, you know, elaborate sets, etc. Um, a lot of the logistics that we were facing were how do we get the things that we need to get from point A to point B? Um, and these could be things like uh, the table when you first come in and all of the merchandise to put upon that table, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, if we don't have a budget and we want to, and maybe we have a little grant from the Arts Council, but we don't have a huge budget, what can we do for fundraising that is not um, intrusive to the to the play or to the performance? Um, so, like I said, a lot of the communication strategies that we came up with and making people feel part of that community were shaped around the fact that we did often need to ask that community and ask those audience members um, for help. And it's a lot easier to do when you can gr kind of grow this fan base. Um, and I think that that translates also over to the SDA. I think that Comedia is, if not, I basically think it is the perfect sort of theater space to grow that community because there are opportunities to acknowledge patrons, make audience members part of the magic, um, work through the scenarios. I think um, it was Ollie who was kind of talking about how he led the audience into the play by, you know, sort of starting off with some songs, selling merchandise, et cetera, and then kind of got them into the performance. And that is something that you can do if you have your communication plan set up, you have your communication strategy set up. And there's so many great tactics now, social media, um, bulletin boards, et cetera, et cetera, that can help to facilitate that strategy. Um, it's just a matter of using them and then, um, also, sometimes I think in the SEA we get stuck on Facebook, but it's not the only, it's not the only social media out there. So um, I also like, like you said, I'm an author and I tend to think about how to write something and have somebody <laughs> see it. So I do tend to fixate on that, but those are some of the ideas that I was thinking, I'm like, hey, what can I bring to the table? Um, so yeah, that's what I've got. I got a quick question. I, I remember Sweet Tea Shakespeare Company does something crazy that I'd love to know if you could tell me more about, where they set up big chairs with some beautiful decorations on the like front and center, um, front row center, two chairs, and they auction them off at the beginning of the show. Um, this tradition? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So there's a couple of pre-show things that they do that I think are super helpful. And that I think would also kind of work in the SDA, given the, the right audience. Um, you, so what Sophie was talking about is, yes, there, were, there was like this couch, it was this antique couch, and it, looked, it was covered with velvet, but it was kind of old. Um, but there was, uh, next to that would be a little basket full of, um, there was, I think, some wine, and there were some chocolates, and there was like a sweet tea shirt, you know, just things that you could, um, you know, th just little things, and they would run an auction at the beginning, and if you would, you know, however much you donated, if you won the auction, you got to sit in this very comfortable seat, and you got the gift basket, and it was just a very, you know, it was just a very cool, fun thing. And it was at every performance. So you knew if you were a regular attendee at these performances that this would be there and that you could take advantage of it. And I did. And it was very awesome. The one time I actually won, it was very comfortable. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Um, they, they also did some pre-show things like they had the, the picture frame. It was this very ornate frame. And they would bring it around and solicit people to take pictures within the frame. Um, and then eventually they got like a little crown and they got some uh, Elizabethan ruffs, which I think were actually from Ikea and weren't actually ruffs, but they would invite people to wear these props and take the picture and then um, tag themselves. And so all of this generated a lot of involvement and it also prepped the audience to be participants and not just passive viewers of the upcoming show. That's beautiful. I did not realize that's what I was getting suckered into. I went to see Macbeth and they put the frame around me and I'm like, what am I doing? And it turned out to be hilarious. And so I see that is actually sneaky, a sneaky way of getting me to post a picture saying, I'm having a great time at Sweet Tea Shakespeare Company. So yep. that's beautiful. I love that. All right, that's super great logistics support. Beautiful ideas. Thank you, darling. So beautiful. So we're gonna move on to Paula. 
Paula, um, Paula Brinkman comes to us from um, somewhere between Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio, in a place called Mason, where the Mason community players operate, and she's got a lot of experience with them, and also is the uh, Capo, Comico, and uh, beloved director of my old troupe, East Gondali, that does Comedia. So, Paula, tell us your additional ideas about logistics and setting up things for rehearsals and performances and getting it all to work. Well, I just have two much more basic because, wow, fundraising and all that stuff, wow, way beyond us. Um, we ran into very early, we ran into the difficulty between do you start with a scenario that's already written, an extant scenario, and try to cast from it? Or do you find out who wants to play and then write your own based on who you got? Do I have five people this weekend? Do I have 10 people this weekend? Um, so that was a very big jumping off point for us is we started with some pre-written scenarios and when we ran into that roadblock, we started writing our own. And then we'd have some in the bank of, okay, we've only got five people available this weekend. Let's find a five person scenario. Maybe we all hopefully remember it from a couple of years back. So um, would you say that it's kind of a natural progression to start with existing scenarios and learn your craft that way and learn to be as a team. And then it's kind of natural to move from that into writing your own. And then, like you said, you have some in the bank. I think it made, it's probably an evolution for every individual group. Um, it was, that was the evolution for Skandali. Um, it's very different than working with an existing play, like in a community theater situation where you say, we're having importance of being earnest this week um auditions there's 15 parts come out and 40 people show up that just doesn't happen in the sca with comedia um it would be lovely if it did but um so i wanted to just say that's a consideration when you're when you're thinking about building a troop or joining a troop that you that there's always room for writing at times the other thing is um fundraising skandali never kept our own money we always donated to the Royal Travel Fund. So the idea of having troop money is just absolutely foreign to me. <laughs> um, but one thing we did do for fundraising on occasion, besides just simply passing the hat, is on a couple of different occasions when there were um, silent auctions at various events, we would auction off a walk-on part. And we were really sneaky about it because the walk-on part didn't have to go to the winner. The winner just decided who got the walk-on part. So one time the Baroness uh, outbid her husband and gave him the part. Oh. And he didn't know it. Oh, that's hilarious. So we dragged him up there. Or you put them into, you talk about so-and-so's naughty corset shop. It doesn't always have to be Drea's. It can be lady so-and-so's because <laughs> she won the silent auction. She's sitting in the audience and she gets a shout out. So that was one of our ideas. So I pass, I'm done. No, that's brilliant. I do not remember putting somebody else's name on Mr. Stray's corset shop. That's awesome because then you could also like have a tavern and name mm -hmm. it or, you know, Lord Joe, Lord Joe's tavern. You know, <laughs> you keep referring to the tavern named after a person that you want to, genius. <laughs> oh my God, these are great ideas. <laughs> You could name that Tories University after it. Oh yeah. And oh my gosh. The silent auction thing went over really well on a couple of occasions because people were out bidding and saying, I want to be in a show. And somebody's like, I'm going to put somebody else in the show. Yep. Okay. I, I'm writing all this down. This is great. <laughs> all right. Super. All right. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Jay Cross, uh, the magnificent uh, Jay Cross, who taught me a lot of what I know about Comedia 20 years ago. And um, uh, you have been doing Comedia longer than anybody, I think, ever. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about where you're coming from, because you also didn't get to introduce yourself in the last session. I want people to know you. So tell me, tell the world your, um, you know, 60 second elevator speech. Hi, I'm Jay Cross. I have been doing Comedia, well, 35 years if you include when I was first fiddling around with it, but 30 years with E. Sebastiani. Um, and I believe Ollie Crick's been doing it longer than me. Now we know. But, 
now we know. <laughs> the um, and E. Sebastiani is a uh, a troop in the Boston area. If you look up uh, the Rutledge Compendium of Com Commedia dell'arte, there's a whole chapter about us, mm -hmm. and uh, because we've been around a long time. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different approaches to doing Commedia, uh, and our particular approach is trying to present a show that keeps people in the uh, the mindset of this this could be uh, the 16th century, right? And and so we try not to have modern jokes to to break you out of it, um, and. You know, I, I have no objection to some other troupe having Baby Yoda in their their show, but we're not going to do it. And um, so uh, that's just kind of the thing. We've been together a, a very long time. Uh, pretty much everybody in the troupe is a Laurel now. And um, the uh, one of the reasons that we are together is that um, we've had uh, good spaces to practice in. Um, that we just have it as a regular thing. Is it Tuesday? I'm at rehearsal, except tonight, right? That, that we just did a show on Sunday. So we said, oh, let's take tomorrow off. And um, so I'm, I'm here talking to you guys instead of rehearsing. But generally if it's Tuesday, I'm at rehearsal. And we've got, um, I guess uh, Paula was talking about uh, having a, a bunch of plays to choose from. We have about 400 now and um, that, you know, it's it's handy having having it so that you know, okay, we've been invited to perform at this event, or we think we want to perform here. Um, who's in? We see who's in. Who can we recruit if we think that we're just one short of doing some play we really want to do? If not, you know, we look it up and okay, so uh, nine, we got a seven and two. What what plays do we have that are seven and two? We got these twelve plays. Which which one do we feel up to right now? And um, uh, so it's it's helpful having a a deep inventory of plays. I recommend as a starting point if you don't already have a hundred, um, get Thomas Heck's book, um, the uh, Casa Marciano scenarios. There's 167 scenarios in there, uh, many of which are relatively uh, small cast, and uh, so that's a a good beginning resource. And then you know any scenario if you've done any comedian, you know, you can just take it and tweak it, right? It's just like, oh, we need an extra character. Okay, well, let's come up with a sort of parallel plot line and add this this extra character. Or, oh, we got to cut somebody out. You know, oh, well, there's two pairs of lovers in this scenario. Let's cut one pair out, and you know, now we're down two. The um, so it's it's pretty easy to follow the same thing, and so having having that source as a, uh, a place to begin gives you a lot of good scenarios right away. Uh, we practice in a, uh, um, a, a big old factory that's been converted to artist space. And uh, two of our members have um, a kind of a big space inside that, that big old factory. And so that's just always there. We moved there after MIT kicked us out, that we had been practicing for, you know, like the first 18 years at MIT. Um, it doesn't have to be a school of that prestige level, it just needs to be a school, right? <laughs> so, um, so just, you know, find a school or a church or something that's, that's gonna give you space. And um, I would recommend if you've got a local troupe, practice every week. Keep it fun, um, and that's it. Hey, can you talk a little bit about what you guys went through when you were making that transition from MIT to uh, your factory space? Like, what other options did you consider? Where did you go looking? How did you go about that? Uh, well, we kind of looked at what was near the geographic center of where everybody lived and uh, tried to limit ourselves to that. And um, the first place that came up was was uh, Fritz and Harold's uh, artist mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. and it was good enough that we never went anywhere else. So, you know, we, we <laughs> could have kept looking, but you know, it's uh, there's there's uh, a hurdle to you know, like going out and actually asking somebody when you already have something that's working. It's it seems mm -hmm. like an unnecessary hurdle. Mm 
Mm, yes, of course. The uh, another thing that I wanted to just quickly say about our particular situation that that might be different from some of yours, but definitely different from Ollie's, is um, we never were in a position where our livelihood depended on acting, right? And um, the we've occasionally gone through stretches where we thought, let's see if we can make this commercial so that we're getting something out of it. And, um, you know, occasionally we'll do some gig at a university or something and get a thousand dollars or, uh, or whatever. And, you know, it helps to, um, say, Oh, we made money. We're, we're, we're professionals, you know, but, um, the, uh, it's never going to pay the mortgage. Uh, especially not when you split it nine, ten ways. Mm. <laughs> and um, the, and we don't have the energy to go out and try to do some gig like that every week. I, it might mm. be possible for us to do that, mm. but we haven't pushed it to find out because none of us want to. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's still a volunteer group, and it's still yeah. fun because really you get paid in the warm fuzzies of the fun. Right, and it's never been incorporated, so we have no mm -hmm. real place for the money to go. Mm -hmm. And um, that one of the things that came up mm -hmm. today, I guess, I posted video for um, the show we did on Sunday, and the guy from uh, Fools in Progress said, uh, mm -hmm. hey, post it here, get real money. And, you know, we've talked about getting real money, but, you know, for the play, we can just kind of divide it right there. But if you've mm -hmm. got something that's... Um, you know, a, a video presence for yeah. some period of time. And if I've got 20 plays that I've posted video of with mixed cast for all of them, mm -hmm. how do you track how to divide the money when it eventually comes in? You, you, <clears throat> you just can't do it. Um, and I've always been of the opinion that the person that, that records the video and edits the video and posts the video should get all of it. But, but I don't get agreement from that from the rest of the troupe. Because so. that's you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's me. It's me. I, oh, uh, <laughs> happens to be that. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother, I think that's a whole nother webinar's worth of, um, of discussion that we could absolutely do at another time. Um, yeah. Talking about those kinds of things, you know, making videos and the resources you have and copyright. Right. Yeah, and, we talked about that yeah. earlier with, with just the scenarios, right? I, like mm -hmm. I, you know, wrote a scenario and said, you know, it's copyright me, right? And he was like, why are you copywriting this? You know, it's, I can't let anybody use it mm -hmm. if it's not copyrighted, mm -hmm. you know, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, suddenly it's, you know, mm -hmm. some, somebody wants to use it and, and you can't do it. Uh, right. So, yeah. Having a name on there that says copyright by, and then letting that person say, I'm going to, you know, put, put creative commons licensing on it or something like that. Yeah. That's and, anything just, just, just so it's, yeah. it's there. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. absolutely. Super. All right. So we are going to have another talk about that in another webinar. Yeah, that's sure. A lot. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. a big deal and, and way yeah. off the topic of what we're trying to cover now. That's okay. It's all good stuff. So we're definitely going to spread off onto that another time. And speaking of other stuff, you know who really had a lot of ideas about what to talk about today? What? <laughs> it's Amanda, the person who's next in the queue. So I'm going to just shut up way. and it's her turn. Great segue, Jay. Perfect. Amanda. Amanda Mulder is a wonderful teacher of many, many, many things. And she managed the troupe Ivaganda Vagando Stolti uh, up in Maryland for a bunch of years. And that's how uh, I pretty much got to meet her. So Amanda, tell us about yourself a little bit more. Tell the whole world and then tell us your logistics ideas. Okay, so hello, Comedia World. Um, I've been doing Comedia for 17 years um, in Pennsylvania, Maryland. Um, I've done everything from uh, write my own plays, managing a group um, as Capicomico. I've done some, we, I was kind of manager. We did some festivals and professional, sort of professional performing, performing and we teach. Um, so logistics are, are one of those things that our art can feel like a nightmare when you're hitting a wall. But um, there are some things that we encountered that helped us, you know, rehearse and execute our performances. Um, like uh, Laura said, I, I, 
I'm in the field of education, so I'm kind of building off on what Jay said. Um, I've been fortunate that I have able to rehearse at my school. Uh, schools always have a huge multi-purpose room, which we, we used to do movement exercises. And um, schools, I have always had a classroom, just move the desks, use the projector, project the scenario, do what you need to do, record. It was very easy. Um, there have been other times where I didn't have a school that I found some good resources. Um, when I didn't have a school available, a lot of libraries have meeting spaces for not-for-profit groups or non-profit groups. Those are good rehearsal spaces too. Um, there's a lot of space there to do more of the movement-based activities that Comedia, that are in Comedia. Um, some, I found through some of my experience that there are some organizations out there, whether it's a store um, or different, different places that have meeting rooms. There was one time I was doing some media and some dance um, things in Harrisburg and there was a place called Gander Mountain and they had a huge room that you could use if you could justify that you could do your art outside which we perform outside a lot so that is actually amazing dance studios or, or ballet studios are a place that we've practiced at on occasion yeah, oh, and it's just amazing what resources are out there that maybe you're not thinking of it, but it never hurts to call the um, store or like Jay said, call the studio and see um, what they can offer because I found in the artist community, we want to support the art. So we all have that passion. Um, and some of these places, they want to support people doing activities. <laughs> um, there's not a lot, you know, it's, it's getting scarce out there. So your options could be out there um, and it doesn't hurt to ask your group what resources are in the group. Maybe someone has a church that they go to that you could use church space or, you know, maybe someone else is a teacher. Um, so there are some, there are some options out there. Um, you just kind of have to communicate, get out there. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Um, another strategy that we use that I found, I liked it. Um, I found it very, very successful. Um, I have some really good memories from doing it. Um, when I used to act with, um, in Pittsburgh, um, I think EG and ECI at the time, they, they had the phrase kamikaze comedia, um, where you, you go out in the community and you kind of rehearse in a public space. Like this is after you have things really fleshed out, you know, okay. and you're just trying to, um, kind of get a feel for, you know, maybe the space you're at, or, or maybe you want the random interactions with people like going through the park. Um, mm. And so there's a couple of theaters. Um, before I left um, Pennsylvania, there's like this beautiful amphitheater here in Erie and it's outdoors and the acoustics are amazing. Um, and, and there's never anything going on there. It's the weirdest thing. So, uh, some of my former groups, when we had everything together and we were ready to perform, I, I'm just like, let's take our last two dress rehearsals to the amphitheater and see how things go. And um, on our first time we were there, we had people, it was in the middle of summer, we were, we were rehearsing, we were in a Renaissance Fair festival, um, and people walked by, and then they, they said, wow, wow, um, <laughs> you guys are so great. Uh, and they sat and watched our whole performance and they asked us, hey, hey, are you guys performing again? And I looked at them, um, I said, well, next week they're, we're rehearsing here again. It's gonna be the same show, but you're welcome, <laughs> enjoy. And I thought with, you know, the way life is that, you know, it kind of, um, <laughs> you know, into our own lives. I, I honestly didn't expect to see them again, but they were there, they were there the following Thursday. <laughs> They liked it so much they wanted to be in our show again and they <laughs> wanted Did you make them join? Yes. Yeah, um <laughs> I tried. I tried it because we 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 our show at the time we dressed them up and they were part of the performance to kind of engage the audience. So we got some new fans too and they even brought me flowers a second time. It was really, really sweet. <laughs> so I that's think it's great. it's super fun to like take it into the community if you if that's something you feel comfortable with and the people 
that you're with um, feel comfortable because it is a, you know, there is an improv element. And if you can engage with people, you can practice that improv and you can also um, introduce other people to the joy of Comedia, whether they know that they want it or not. So there's just some really good memories there and some kind of alternative ways to work out the logistical piece. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we've, we, uh, when I was with Lagana Stolte, we basically, in order to kind of collaborate with local, local groups, we, we would just basically fill out an application. We had a website, we had videos on our website, and we would contact, um, we, con we contact Artscape, which is a big um, free arts festival uh, in the East Coast. And we were able to perform there. They looked at our, they didn't know anything about us. They looked at our website, they looked at the video and said, yeah, we'd love it if you guys performed. Um, and then there were a couple other festivals, Spoutwood and some fairy festivals. And um, we got accepted the one year and then the next year we didn't. And I kind of like, just asked them why, you know, you <laughs> know, can you give us feedback? And they told us that, well, the first year you guys performed, you were, you were awesome, but um, you were a new performer. And we try to give new performers, um, we try to put them on the schedule to mix things up for the people at our festival. And, um, you know, and we do that, we had some other new performers. So if you are trying to collaborate with a group, um, don't get discouraged. It might not even be anything personal. Um, it might be that, like the same kind of performer philosophy, give, give the new guy a chance, you know, and, and that's something we can respect as performers. And, that's, and as a festival, keep changing the name of your group. Yes, <laughs> we did that for a little while and then people started to catch on, but <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out now. I want to totally oh do it. Oh my God. So, um, but that's great. They, they contacted us for a fall festival. Like they actually contacted us. So if wow. you rapport with a festival and, or with um, a group, they'll reach out to you again. Maybe if, if it's not that time, they'll reach, I believe they'll reach out to you in the future. If, if you are, um, you know, a good, have a good collaboration going on. So um, as far as making money, I mean, we made a, we made a couple of money. We made a little bit of money on Artscape and some festivals, but we just reinvested it back in the group um, because we're so kind of teaching and, you know, doing the nonprofit thing. And we all, um, pretty much at that time, we just uh, unfortunately like invest a lot of our own funding into making things happen, or you know the routine the routine um, trip to the thrift store, or you know making yourself made a lot of props um, ourselves. So mm -hmm. there are, there are ways to do things. Um, luckily, you know, Comedia, you can do things with minimum props and, and scenery and such. So it can be a lower cost endeavor than some other forms of theater. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, I got to say changing your name multiple times is a little bit like cheating, but I wouldn't report you. Um, okay, like, thanks. <laughs> I still think it's, it gets the job done. You know, it gets comedia out there in the world. Uh, yeah. but I'm going to rope in uh, Erica here. And uh, Erica, if you can turn your video on. Um, uh, Erica is uh, one of our other actor friends. Hello, darling. Hi. And, uh, I'm wondering, do you have uh, any other ideas about logistics, anything that we haven't covered or stuff that you think is a genius idea that we just haven't hit on yet? I kept thinking of so many things that I wanted to say while you guys were talking and now, I'm just <laughs> but I remember when, um, when I was in East Gandali, um, with you guys, that we had people from, at one point, Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, and that was logistical, it was fun. Um, and <laughs> all right, it was not fun, um, but we tried, we tried to do a show in each person's state, which, you know, was, um, which was a challenge, but it was, it was interesting getting to see people in new audiences and, um, and, uh, um, I remember when Paula was talking about, um, having scenarios and then writing your own scenarios and the um, 
having to prepare because you don't know always how many uh, people you're going to actually have at any one given time. Sometimes you don't know how many people you're going to have for a given performance, even if you had counted on them. <laughs> and Under I, studies, they I also remember doing a kamikaze rewrite, um, uh, and on, on more than one occasion. Um, and it it's a challenge, but actually it kind of was fun for me after a while when the <laughs> <laughs> um, because there once you figure out the and there is a formula to commedia in 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 the in the way that you write it um and it, if you figure out the formula and you really learn what the motivations of each of the characters are it's a lot easier um, to, um, as my old editor would say, drop back and punt. Um, I don't even know what that means. He used that all the time when something went horribly wrong. <laughs> in you know, it has to do with baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the sports ball. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, um, it's 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 all about being um, um, able to improv in on every single level whether it's rewriting a scenario whether it's you know adding a character dropping a character um because they you know i don't know didn't show up for rehearsal at all and then showed up at the performance even after we rewrote the scenario that never happened <laughs> um, no, no, i'm sure that's just imaginary thank you. Um, but you but know, anyway, it's, it's, erica you you've given us a great segue into the second topic of content. Um, so we always try to get content into our scenario that's going to be really a good hook for the audience, get them relatable to the characters, and make the audience feel like they're part of the show, because that's what it's all about with Commedia. And so finding ways to do that is uh, part of the challenge of the art uh, and then session uh, we were talking a lot about um, making uh, references in your play to things going on in the real world in that location uh, and that's um, uh, that also refers to that period practice of taking a trip to a new city and then going and listening to all of the gossip in the taverns or public houses of whatever kind and taking those rumors and gossip bits and pieces that you hear amongst the people and putting that into your scenario somehow. So that's one very cool bit, um, how you do that and more details on what kind of content is really a good um, engagement tool uh, is the next topic that I wanna get into. Um, so we're gonna go back in the order we went in and I, I think it was Rachel that went first. Am I disappearing again now? <laughs> um, no, no, go ahead and stay. Doesn't matter. Okay. We're a small group this time, so it's not. A, I'm not worried as much. So uh, Rachel, go ahead and give us some more wisdom about that meaty content and how we can keep it engaging for the audience. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm really kind of, like I said, I'm, I'm really kind of, I go down research rabbit holes all the time. <laughs> and music. Music is one of the things that I think we see consistently incorporated into theatrical performances. And it's something that people can relate to because music is something that is, you know, it's timeless. And I was thinking about the, you know, we kind of talked about the Twelfth Night scenario that we did. And I thought, you know, how cool it would it would it be to do a scenario, maybe like a Shakespeare or something, incorporating SEA songs. So when Count Orsino is talking about, you know, play me something, you know, swoopy and romantic, and then the band starts playing Fair Lady Atlantia you would you know it would be kind of perfect and so i think there is an opportunity um to in in 
theater and I'm, like I said I, I'm not a really a comedia expert I just sort of play one on TV right now um, but that is something that is or music is something that is this this emotional touch point for many people and is something that could be used in a variety of ways to create engagement with with whatever you're performing whether it be um, pure comedia or Shakespeare or like we were talking about before the session started a German uh, Brussels or German Belgian Flemish hybrid of a play that Shakespeare wrote that somebody saw and then wanted to translate and try playing with their group of characters as they went on the road you know <laughs> so yeah music is uh, like I said that's my thing right now it's the thing that I think is uh, a really great way to to say things that the actors can't put into words. So. That's a good point. I mean, you gave me a, you, you gave us a bombshell at the end there. Uh, the, the music being engaging is one thing. Also the music being an emotional touch point, making it very personal music. Um, that's another thing. Um, well, the, one of the things that, and again, I'm, I apologize for using Shakespeare instead of Comedia, but I'm trying to pull um, examples from my immediate um, knowledge. And Shakespeare, if you look at the characters who sing and perform, he made very deliberate decisions about what each of them would be familiar with, would reference, would sing, um, whether it was a folk song or a popular song that everybody knew you know, bringing it in from the outside, like Fair Lady Atlantia, it's a popular song in Atlantia, everybody knows it, maybe we'll have this character whistle it as he walks along, to um, this character's going crazy, so we're going to have them sing this certain kind of a song that's, um, you know, she's a princess, so she wouldn't normally be singing a folk song, but now she's going nuts, and we're going to show that she's distracted um, by having her sing this. So it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's a way that you can give the audience a closer insight into what that character is thinking or feeling without saying it out loud. Okay, I'm writing down some of this. this that's brilliant. Um, it says more about a character when you say it with song. Okay, Erica looks like she's about to explode. <laughs> Go ahead. You got to turn your mic on, Erica. I, 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 lo I love, 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 love doing that so very much because I remember we did that for, for All Stars. And when the two lovers met, I did a, a filk of um, I'll Know from um, Guys and Dolls, which is the schmoopy song between um, Sky Masterson and... Um, but I can't remember the leading. Uh, I actually did this part, and I can't remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, but it was it, what you said. You know, it 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 it's the way that the, the character would present themselves, and um, she was this kind of um, starry-eyed, um, you know, person who just didn't believe she belonged where she was, and she went longed to, to get out there and and hear this exciting young man comes along and yeah I just I think that's cool. that is fun so anyway sorry yeah you're right um I we sh we should have a whole nother webinar on how to incorporate music <laughs> and 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 dance also because Amanda's done some of that um that's been a heck of a lot of fun um all right we're that's another great idea for another webinar <laughs> so all right uh did we move on to Paula or Jay next Paula would be next. Okay, let's go to Paula. So Paula, can you tell me more about content? And actually I have an idea for something I want to ask you about if you don't come to it naturally. Okay, um, well, I was only going to hit one thing. Uh, uh -huh. within, the, within the SCA, within Skin Valley, we find ourselves really struggling artistically with the difference be with walking the line between body period scenarios and being family friendly. Fiji. We um, actually, I, I, we lambast ourselves as being PG-14. If your kid is old enough to know what's going on, that's on you. 
Um, if they understand it, you may have to have a conversation later. Um, this is the most offensive thing we're going to present. Let this be your barometer. And we usually bring Drake out. <laughs> and we've had people say, yeah, this might not be my cup of tea and leave during the intro. <laughs> just in case. Um, rather than sit there for 20 minutes and realize they shouldn't be there with their 10 year old at nine o'clock at night for an evening scenario. Um, <laughs> So we, we do try to give an audience warning if we're going to walk on the wild side a little bit. Um, yeah, I just kind of wonder how other troops deal with that. To, to be fair, Drake usually really let it rip. His, his um, if you are offended by this, is usually way, 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 way more offensive than anything we wrote. So... <laughs> <laughs> um anyway yeah um so well, maybe that's a good point you know if you're going to use a barometer really use the barometer you know like say take your actual play and if you've got some you know adult prop of some kind uh then you, you bring that out and if you have like the worst words that you've used pick the words that are actually in the play instead of letting drake go off into his fantasy land <laughs> The limerick that he chose was usually really, really bad. <laughs> I mean, oh, he chose a limerick that wasn't used in the show. And, and, Occasionally. Yeah. With permission. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With permission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Set the bar really low. If you're going to go, f if you're really going to go for it, set the bar really low. If this offends you, this might not be your cup of tea. If you can handle this, you can handle anything we're going to throw at you in the next 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the time, because Drake and I wrote a lot of the quote, quote naughty shows for, for Skandali, the, mm -hmm. my goal was always to um, make them laugh like a 12 year old recognizing that a joke was dirty and drake's job was to push it just a little bit further so i believe that and this yeah. is kind of what i was going to ask you about paula when it comes to content one of the engaging pieces of content is the adult stuff uh that's not family friendly and i find that uh e Forenzi also does an annual naughty show and in an enclosed space so that you can be very careful, you know, only 18 and older go in here. And um, I advertise it widely and we're very clear. And some people consider that advertising to be, you know, engaging for them. They want to see the stuff they don't normally get to see all year long. That's still historically accurate. And we've got the woodcuts and the paintings to prove it. Uh, and we're inspired by real stuff. We're trying to really recreate something that could have happened back then. And um, it, it, balancing that with genuinely good humor, mm -hmm. uh, hard. And, uh, you know, just going for the really blue jokes is, you know, sometimes it gets boring after a while and sometimes mm -hmm. it's not really engaging, but finding that nice, balance between something that's a little exciting because it's naughty and it's not every day and it's adult only that can be um that can be engaging and it's a kind of a balance yeah my little joke was if it was if it's uncomfortable it's not generally funny i mean you could push uncomfortable with the rule of three and you can get a cheap laugh mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but it you know uh it's just because people are so uncomfortable that they're like <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a little mess. See where you're going with this. Um, so I tell you what, guys. Uh, Rachel does have to go, um, but I wanted to get a picture of everybody from this session, like I did the last one. So if you don't mind taking just a moment to wave at the webinar camera, and and you know that's that's you, <laughs> Erica. <laughs> I didn't know because I wasn't on the original panel, so. No, just go ahead. Everybody's waving and we're all saying we're having a great International Committee de Larte Day. Big smiles. <laughs> you got okay. it? Okay. No, Erica, you really need to smile genuine, like normal. <laughs> normal. Yes, no, it was funny. I got a weird one on you. Okay. Everybody's happy. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, guys. All right, super. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Go back to your call with the people that are working with you there. Um, super, guys. Thank you. Sorry, right. I don't do cameras well. No. So. <laughs> it was 
it was it was just a funny a funny kind of a smile um Anyway, so you guys, thanks for making a note on adult content. Um, I think it can be engaging and it's a tool like any other, it can be overused. Um, so uh, let's move on to Jay. Um, you look like you might have an idea to add uh, either on the topic of adult content or not. You know, I'm always a thousand ideas and there's a competition to see which one gets out of my mouth first. But the, um, in terms of adult content, uh, Isabastiani spent about 12 to 15 years having a regular naughty show that we did for a group that hired us to do a naughty show at Penzik each year. And then they started having children and said, hold it on the naughty stuff. <laughs> but, um, but the naughty stuff, you know, it's like, how naughty can you get? You know, we had several shows where, um, you know, women exposed their breasts or uh, shows where, um you know some awful thing was happening where uh somebody had tricked somebody else into um guzzling a goblet of uh seminal fluid or you know it was a, I was, those were the most extreme that that we had done uh we weren't really too big on cussing on stage that the you know we didn't we didn't do that very much um Going back a couple of layers, though, not, not about adult content anymore, but um, about the uh, specifics of identifying, you know, who should we talk about, right? Who, you know, we want to make some, some local references here. Um, we had a few occasions where we found out who the local people were and, and stuff that we could say about them. Mm -hmm. and uh, unwittingly tagged somebody who was a little bit fragile and, and didn't know that a joke was a joke and, and thought maybe it was an accusation. And um, that it's not always safe to, to you know, do that, right? And, and, um, Good note. Good note. Do the research. Yeah, yeah. Find, find out who's comfortable with it before. It's, it's not just who's the top of the line and obviously they're the person to poke, you know? Mm. And um, so let's see what else. Uh, this is a, um, I'm not a big fan of having a cheap throwaway joke. You know, that I think it's, it's a better comedia show if you're not telling a joke, but you are the joke. Right. And that um, just to, to, not not to to poke fun at you, Sophie, um, but I give you permission to poke at fun at me today. Okay, so Sunday only permission. <laughs> when you are on stage and you are being the joke, man, you are a riot, right? Uh, just just you know, flinging your body every which way and and uh, <laughs> being whatever it is that that you're being. That's hilarious. The um um. Uh, Drea's corset shop half off, you know, that's, that's a cheap joke. And it, it, it sounds like a cheap joke and, and it's, it's beneath what, what else you do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you may think like, it is a funny joke, right? Because I mean, in principle, it's a con funny concept at this corset and it's half off, you know, um, but the, the physical humor and you being funny is, is a lot funnier than you telling a joke. Oh, I agree. I absolutely agree. And, and um, and I, I think that's the case for everybody in every comedia show. And it's it's so tempting because you think it's humor. What am I supposed to do here? Tell jokes, right? Oh, I'll think of some clever jokes. But really, the funniest thing you can do is to be very emotional mm. and very responsive that's, to what's going on around you. That's a very good tip. Be emotional and responsive. That's right. that's a great way to summarize it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's almost 100% of what Comedia is. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm done. So uh, off to Amanda. <laughs> Super. All right, Amanda, thinking about content. Um, so content wise, um, I've done a bunch of those ideas. But another thing that I have done is I have looked at old um, you know, extant scenarios. And I think about, I try to think about like um, 
what was the joke back then and how could like I update it with something maybe a common experience we ex we have now um a non-comedia example but I'm really proud of it um I was in a theater class recently for continuing education and we were tasked with writing a play and my group wanted to do like a Hansel and Gretel play and what I, I kind of like got into my comedian mindset, even though none of my, <laughs> none of my uh, group mates were really as motivated as I was, but I kind of went through the same process with, with this project, but I thought about Hansel and Gretel and I thought about like the, what the original story meant about, um, about fears and starvation and cannibalism in, in the Middle Ages and I, and how it had been passed throughout time. And then I thought about in our, society um, I work with students and basically about what kind of fears we have now in our society and I tried to kind of update the storyline to resonate more with our modern audience. So my update of Hansel and Gretel involved two kids addicted to a game and the father hides it in the woods. Um, so it was a you know a lot of people are afraid of modern day like video game addiction. Um, and the kids decide they can't live without their game and they're in the woods and then they meet Beatrice who is one of my comedic characters I play a lot but she's this like old quirky misunderstood hermit in the woods. So it's another, um, you know, in our society we fear isolation and we fear being misunderstood. So she was kind of the epitome of that in my play. And the kids, they're, you know, having this adventure and they knock on our door and, and they, through some conversations in the play, they see that she's quirky, but they realize like her heart's in the right place. So it's, play is about, you know, facing our fears in society and, you know, kind of resolving, you know, resolving them with, you know, you can have a modern adventure and in a modern adventure, you know, away from your game can, you know, add a lot to your lives. So I, we've done that a lot um, in Vagando Stulti. We've done that with modern connections we've done that with um you know period connections because you can you can think about what the scenario said in the past and kind of connect it to something happening in modern society um a lot of the research i read about comedia um basically you know says they did that in periods so and there are ways to, to keep it you know so you don't kind of what jay said you don't lose that feel of the, um, you know, the original 16th century vibe. Um, and yeah, I, I was very successful. I mean, my classmates gave me a standing ovation. They're like, you must do this a lot. I was like, yeah. Um, so I, I hope, I, I have not performed that play yet, but I hope to kind of, you know, bring it with some comedic characters and give it a role. But anything can be an inspiration. What I wanted to add is, you know, life is comedy. Comedy is all around us. We don't really, I don't believe we have to search for it as much as, you know, we may think. Um, my life is really comical because I work with students. And <laughs> I look, I look around, I, um, uh, I keep a notebook of just like, you know, general things I witness or observe that are super funny. Um, you have to really know your audience and and kind of you know tweak what's funny for different audiences but um for instance i used to work with little kids now i work with college kids but they're both super funny <laughs> <laughs> little kids um i noticed that they often you know their parents buy their clothes like huge and they come to school in these like droopy uh shirts and they're trying to get dressed or take their coat off and i thought it was hilarious so um, I kind of took that kind of like getting dressed humor and I made my Pedralino shirt with those very long like flappy sleeves and in some of the plays that I did in the past we have Pedralino and he has these big clothes big flappy sleeves trying to get into a doublet or something and I mean it was based on something I just saw like watching and you know experiencing. Um, someone recently one of my college students said that they had they, they transferred from a different university and they got like a credit, for, they got a, a credit for eating at a picnic. And I was like, oh, Art Lakino could do that. So maybe in a future play, I'll have Art Lakino. He's graduated from university, he ate to get his credits or something. And people are like floored, like Art Lakino, what did you study? 
Because I just mattress testing. So funny. <laughs> so really, and um, one last example, it's kind of relates to comedia because we're always talking about like characters and their clothes, and clothes are super funny. And um, I had a I had a student who his roommate was running around and like just a t like a big t-shirt and no pants, and he's like, "This is college. Keep your pants on." So then I started thinking like different scenarios. When would you sh when should you keep your pants on? So. That might even be like, you know, kind of a tagline that people repeat in a future scenario. So what I say is, you know, look around you, experience life. Um, taking a notebook around is really handy because I find writing things down, I have more ideas and your notebook's always there where your phone's sometimes dead. So I have like just all these notebooks I carry around and I keep those ideas in there because I'll, I'll forget them because my life does get busy and you get kind of lost in the daily grind. But you know, life can be comedy and just don't forget that when you're trying to write, either write your own play or take something that was period and turn it into a relevant comedy for the modern audience. That's brilliant, I love it. Yeah. Now, next time I'm in an airport, I'm gonna make sure to sit and break out my notebook and just watch for- Yeah, I'm flying to Texas in, in March to speak for a conference for work and I'm gonna take my book and I'm gonna write down some things because there's always something that happens um it's just mm. it's out there you just gotta watch so yeah gotta watch Beautiful. Erica it's your turn <laughs> I actually didn't come prepared to talk so but I love oh. love love that idea of 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 uh people watching because I I adore people watching. I just don't I actually think to write it down. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it, it is a way to um, connect with the modern audience because they will see themselves in, in the scenario, even if you are trying to do a truly period scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, they can yeah. say, oh my god, I just saw my roommate do that a week ago, you know? <laughs> so relevant. Um, and, and I think that definitely will allow people to, um, to, to become way more engaged in, in, in um, a scenario or an art form that they maybe, like you said, you just did randomly on, on the streets during practices out in the wild and you know you're able to engage people because you were able to somehow draw them in with relevance and I think that's a wonderful idea so um, yeah thank you and and I and yeah writing things down yeah I even realize as an artist I'll go back through and get other ideas like you put it aside then you read and you're like oh my god that happened now I have another idea so it's like, it's just good to have that, you know, and, and kind of look through it. It's, it definitely has helped me a lot in, you know, comedia performances, so. Yeah, because when I, when I write scenarios, I, I literally just think of it in terms of the personality of the character, but I don't think about adding that extra layer, which is great. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah this is awesome. But, you know, it's Arlequino as a, you know, stoner only, you know, um, you know, he's got the munchies because he accidentally got into some stash that Pantaloni had that he was trying to, to sell or something like that, you know, but, you know, and, and college kids are like, hey, dude, mm -hmm. you know, this is still our Lakino and it's still what our Lakino would do, but mm -hmm. it's something that they're like, huh, you know, are they watching me? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so. So, hey, you guys, uh, we need to wrap up, at least for the sake of the recording. We're just a little bit over an hour. So um, I'm going to I'm gonna encourage you to give us your last thoughts on, um, you know, logistics and content in particular for folks who are trying to get Commedia off the ground. Um, and uh, just offer us your last thoughts and, you know, any possible uh, other um uh, spin-offs we can do for other webinars. Uh, I'm definitely keeping track of that. So uh, your last thoughts and then we'll wrap up for the evening. Uh, so Rachel had to go do another real life call that had something to do with making money. Uh, so I certainly encourage that. Um, uh, I tell you what, Paula. let's go from top to bottom on my screen. <laughs> so we've got Paula, uh, your last thoughts. 
louder, faster, funnier. And things are always funny in th ones, th five. Ah, crap, I can't say it. Things are always funny in ones, threes, and twenties. Theo, One, get out of the background. Uh, yep. <laughs> Hi. Hi, <laughs> <I> Theo. <laughs> All right, super. Um, Jay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, recruit people who live near you. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> That's real. That's Especially real. if they're people you like. Yes, near you and likable. Yeah, very, very real needs. Yeah, <laughs> super. Erica, what do you think? Um, rehearsal is more important than you think. Uh, it may be oh, improv, right. but um, getting to um, know the people that you're playing with and learning how to react to them as, as people and as characters um, it can help you become better improv. People. And I think that a lot of time people like, I don't need to rehearse. This is improv. I'm going to just wing it. Um, and um, I know that I've been accused over the years of being a little over prepared, but um, I, I think that, that sometimes um, you, know, you, you really do need to take that into consideration that, that there's a certain amount. Actually, there's a lot more preparation in, in producing a scenario than people think. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. Thank you. I'm going to tell my entire troop that. Say, look at <laughs> Rehearsal is more important than you think. <laughs> All right, Amanda, last thoughts. Um, I would say it's kind of cliche, but really be your authentic self. You're funny. You can do it. Um, you know, I, if I would have listened to people 17 years ago telling me you cannot do this, you suck you'll never do Comedia, I wouldn't be with you guys today. So just trust your heart. If you love what you do, you know, get out there, do it. Um, you know, there's lots of people who want to help and support you. Um, and, you know, yes and let, let your imagination go wild and, you know, let the ideas flow. So go out there, put on the mask, see what happens, do Comedia. I love it. Yes and. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. I'm gonna wrap up the recording. Thank you, everybody, for being here for our uh, 2020 version of International Commedia dell'Arte Day webinars for producing Commedia and getting more out there. So thank you. And um, I'm going to end the recording. Good night.